I want to welcome everybody. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm um, uh, a would-be member of the GSD community. I'm actually in the history department here at Harvard, but I love hanging out here, and I like uh, the ideas, the people, the environment, uh, and so forth. So they, they can't get rid of me. Um, so what I thought I would do is I'm going to just very briefly introduce uh, the panelists. Um, and because you have the program which gives you some information. And then I want to make a few introductory comments. I'll use up some of my time before the talks rather than uh, after, though I'll probably have something to say at that point too. So I think we have a, a wonderful panel here today to think about how the physical form of cities and the urban landscape in North America have shaped social life there, when we're going to be focusing, as I assume you know, on Detroit and Toronto. Uh, Jane Cephas will be talking to us about Detroit. She is a PhD candidate at the GSD. Um, she has been long interested in the relationship between the body and urban landscapes. Her dissertation, which she is hard at work on now, is entitled Beyond the Factory Gates. Detroit and the Aesthetics of Fordism, 1914 to 1941. And it's very, I just would add a personal note here that it's very exciting for me to be introducing Janet. It seems like just yesterday when we were discussing her at the admissions meeting, uh, I see Michael over there. I mean, it does seem like that. I can't believe it probably seemed longer to you than it has to us. Um, and also when I had you in uh, a research seminar, where you did a terrific paper on road gangs and incarceration of black prisoners in the South in the first decades of the 20th century. So I'm very pleased to hear what you're up to now. Uh, Jana has done many other things before coming to the GSD, including being a designer and community activist. And she uh, worked at the Detroit Collaborative Design Center, designing and managing building projects for low-income communities right before she came to the GSD. Charles Waldheim is no stranger to all of you. Uh, he will talk to us about Toronto, where he taught before coming here uh, a couple years ago. Charles is also well known to most of you as the father of landscape urbanism, uh, an important conceptual contribution that brings landscape out of the unbuilt environment and the non-urban world and argues for its centrality to cities and to urban space. Uh, Charles has also worked on Detroit, which I think makes this very special that we'll get both of Jan and Charles's perspectives. He was the editor of Case Lafayette Park Detroit and co-editor of a book called Stalking Detroit. He has also written about the history and future of Chicago uh, and Chicago urbanism in constructed ground. And he's currently working on a book on the history of O'Hare International Airport to be published by Un the University of Chicago Press. And I think I personally am very much looking forward to this book uh, because and I, you may share this view. It will give me a lot more to think about as I sit in O'Hare for endless hours <laughs> waiting uh, for delayed flights. Um, now, I don't know very much about what Jana and Charles are going to be talking about, though I am sure we will find it interesting. But I wanted to raise um, a question for us to keep in mind before we hear from them. Um, uh, this is, I think, a really wonderful opportunity to compare two cities that are in two different national states. And so it gives us a chance to think about how national context um, and state policy and state priorities shape the urban experience. Um, and you know, if you look at, I was telling Charles, I looked at the map, you know, closely, to, and was so struck by how these cities, the, the, how close they are, how much they have in common, sort of ecologically, their relationship to the lakes. And so, I think it's a, just a wonderful laboratory case of how national context can shape what happens uh, in a city. Um, now, uh, I have to give you a little bit of historical and demographic context before we start because I just can't help myself. I, I, I'm an historian and I just have to put things in context. I, I just couldn't start looking at pictures without doing this, so you have to bear with me. So these two cities are approximately 250 miles apart. 
Um, and actually, Charles told me last night that it's a three-hour drive. Accord that says something about the way you drive. But according to Google Maps, it's four and a half hours. <laughs> uh, but they are, they are very much worlds apart. Um, so let's just look briefly. Detroit. Okay, Detroit's population in 1900 was 285,000. In 1950, half a century later, it was 1.8 million. Okay, big growth. In 2000, it was 950,000. So it was half its size in 2000 than what it was in 1950. While the region, the Detroit metropolitan area, mushroomed. So that um, you know, what, you, what we have is you know, a, 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 an area where all of the, po the population and the wealth actually moved out of the city to the surrounding area. In 2000, a third of the population in Detroit was living below the property, below the poverty level. And it was, and this is an important point, this next one, it's actually a very homogeneous city because it is 82% black. So that um, we need to keep that in mind and we need to contrast it to Toronto where uh, in, two, in 1901, because the, the, statistic, the, the, demog the population statistics seem to come in the not on the, the decade, but the, year, the next year in Canada. Um, 1901, the population is 156,000. So it's smaller than Detroit was, because remember, Detroit was 285. It's 156. In 1951, it's 675,000, which is a big increase, but not nearly the size, that 1.8 million that, that, Chicago, that uh, Detroit was, sorry. Um, but it has grown. But here's the key. 2001, uh, Toronto was 2.5 million. And what's important here is this is after what is called amalgamation, basically annexation um, and uh, merger with surrounding towns and cities. Um, and that the last of that had been in 1998. So um, in other words, in 2001, Toronto was two and a half times the size of Detroit. And whereas Detroit shrunk in half, Toronto has mushroomed to almost four times its size in 50 years. Um, and uh, I would also add here that whereas Toronto is known as one of the most multicultural cities in the world, uh, with 47% minority coming from very diverse places, no one group sort of dominating, we have a Detroit that is extremely racially homogeneous. So you know, those are, I think, important uh, uh, pictures for us to keep in mind. And I would just want to make the point um, from these demographic observations that, um, that here's an example of where I think larger political and legal structures have a very big impact on what happens in a city. And this is not so much national policy, but uh, in Detroit, uh, in the state of Michigan, um, I'm sure that it is, was not, has not been possible for decades, as in most northern American cities, to annex. Uh, whereas obviously in Detroit, that has not been the case. And so the city was able to contain within itself the population, the wealth, and so forth. Whereas in a, in a case like Detroit, all of that was moving to areas that were beyond the control of the city. And so you have, you know, incredibly diverse. Charles pointed out to me that the same time that Detroit is 82% black, the suburbs of Detroit are 82% white, or close to that, something like that. Um, uh, okay, so I just would like us to, to keep this issue in mind of how these larger structures, particularly national ones, have an impact on both the physical environment and the lived experience in both of these cities. And let's be alert to that and we can discuss later. Okay, so I guess, Jana, you want to start? <coughs> Thank you, Liz. The city of Detroit, its mayor, city council, businesses, and residents have been trying to reclaim the city for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, reclaim the physical landscape, reclaim the public image of the city. One of the latest manifestations of that attempt to reclaim the city actually comes through this ad from the Chrysler Corporation um, that maybe some of you saw on Super Bowl Sunday. 
Um, the ad was called Imported from Detroit. And the ad focuses on several different kinds of images of the city. It largely focuses initially on external representations of the city. Um, the city as a symbol of automobile production, um, the city as an industrial center. It even begins to suggest a little bit at the vacancy of the city. Um, interestingly, the city is literally reflected and framed by the automobile in the images presented here. Um, the automobile becomes a literal vehicle through which the city is seen and understood. But then there's also some internal representations of the city that occur in this ad as well, and that's in the third um, row of still images shown here. And here we see how natives and residents of the city reflect their own working class history back to themselves. Um, first, the Joe Louis Fist. It's a larger than life sculpture commemorating the African American boxer who defeated the German Nazi Max Schmeling in 1938 to win the world championship in boxing. And then the Detroit Industry Mural, which was painted by Mexican artist Diego Rivera in the Baroque courtyard of the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1932. And actually, Diego Rivera caused quite a ruckus at the time painting this mural because he painted a portrayal of Detroit industry, of Detroit factories, from the perspective of the black and immigrant men who were working the assembly lines, um, much to the chagrin of the industrialists who hired him to paint the murals. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the image they wanted to um, present, but there it is in the, in the Detroit Institute of Arts now. Um, and then finally, the spirit of Detroit is a 26-foot bronze statue outside the city municipal building. And since its dedication in 1958, it's become a literal monument of the city, an official image of the city. And so these are all images um, reflecting narratives of the city's history that was presented in this advertisement. But this is also an image of the city, um, one recognizable to a lot of us here probably from Alex McLean's aerial survey of Detroit from several years ago. Um, but an image recognizable to almost any visitor to the city, to all residents of the city. This is the Detroit that most people would recognize and understand. So I understand the Chrysler commercial as the latest in a long string of attempts to rec rescue Detroit from this last image of the city, to rescue it from images of poverty, crime, joblessness, but especially from images of vacancy and to do that by trying to reinstate the narrative of the industrial city. But at the same time, one of the more interesting things is that I think there have been successful attempts to rescue the image of the city, but not through reinstating its industrial narrative, but rather through the urban agriculture that's been developing in Detroit over the last two decades. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. So this original narrative of Detroit, the narrative of the industrial city, has its origins in the 19th century as the city grew on the plans created by Augustus Woodward in 1807. Um, Woodward's plan proposed a system of hexagonal neighborhood clusters, each with a grand circus at the center. Broad avenues emerged from this central um, circle like spokes extending throughout the city and terminating at other hexagonal neighborhood blocks. The intention was that each circle would serve as a central public space with the fountain, shops, and basic open gathering space. Although Woodward's plan was never fully realized, it was built in part. And by the late 19th century, the city had expanded beyond the boundaries of this initial grand circus as it completed its transformation from this kind of sleepy agricultural outpost town into a booming industrial center. Um, an industrial center that was known initially for its stove production and, of course, later for automobile manufacture. So these regulated spaces of early 20th century Detroit that were very geometric, very ordered, and very legible actually served to reflect a certain union of industry, power, and equal opportunity that was key to the narrative of the industrial city. And this narrative then was inscribed in the formal arrangements of the street grid, in the city's architecture, in the scale and dignity of urban public places, and especially in the predominance of industry in governing the scale and economic direction of the city. So while this early 20th century narrative of industry definitely still lingers in Detroit, as I mentioned earlier, the image of the city has changed drastically. Um, 
Today, Detroit is the poorest city in the United States with more than 40% of residents living in poverty, and it has an official unemployment rate of 33%. Um, so the city that was once home to 2 million residents 60 years ago today has barely 900,000 residents and very few living wage jobs. In a dramatic reversal, then, the technological prowess that built the fourth largest city at the turn of the 20th century had, by the year 2000, left an estimated 30% of the city's buildings vacant and an additional 40% of, lot of um, buildable lots vacant. So the, this overwhelming presence of vacant land in Detroit has presented a logistical nightmare for the city government. Um, in addition to keeping records of far more parcels than the city ever expected to have in its own coffers, the city government is also charged with maintaining all of these vacant lots, a process which consists largely of mowing them, mowing these um, overgrown parcels into neat little lawns um, anywhere from one to three times per year. And so because the city is overwhelmed by the, this burden of mowing what ends up to be about 40,000 vacant lots every year, you can imagine many of these lots end up being bypassed by the city's maintenance crews. In turn, residents frustrated um, with lack of secure um, food resources that are healthy and affordable in the city have taken to transforming these vacant lots into gardens and urban farms. So while many of these smaller farms may consist of a modest plot easily worked by just one or two people, some of the larger ones can take up an entire city block or even more and are worked by tractors and large groups of uh, coordinated volunteers. Um, one of the more innovative urban farms um, was located at Catherine Ferguson Academy. Unfortunately, it was just closed down last year, but had been located there for, I think, think about 10 years or more. Um, Catherine Ferguson Academy is a city high school um, specifically for teen mothers and pregnant teens. The farm at Catherine Ferguson Academy, which we're seeing on the left image here, features a dairy cow, goats, chickens, rabbits, a horse, two hives of bees, as well as a full-size barn built by the young mothers, um, fruit orchards, and a large planting field. So this is all in the center city um, of Detroit. The farm serves as a learning laboratory for the girls at the school, but it also provides needed fresh produce for local residents. Um, vegetables from the farm, honey from the bees, fruits from the orchards are sold by the teens, and this money then is used to fund school projects. So Catherine Ferguson Academy is just one of over 500 farms and gardens in the city that are all part of a very significant informal network that is structured around the maintenance of these agricultural plots, the selling of produce, and the recycling of ag agricultural waste. These farms also constitute larger net networks such as the Detroit Community um, Food Security Network and the Detroit Garden Resource Program, which are basically infrastructures that help support these garm and farden farming networks across the city. So I want to focus a minute on the meaning of this scale of agricultural land in the middle of an urban environment, particularly in the middle of an urban environment that has this very strong industrial history. So this vernacular understanding of urban land as holding a potential to provide economic sustenance for communities but without architectural intervention illustrates a key transformation of landscape intentions here in an urban context from the picturesque to the functional. Um, this productive capacity and therefore value carrying capacity of urban land in this case is found in its ability to sustain communities through production. Um, this is definitely counter to standard valuations of land that are really dependent on an economic um, profit motive which is related to the direct sale of the land itself, meaning that people make money by selling the land, not by working the land itself in an urban environment. So this emphasis on the productive capacity of land transforms the de-densified urban geography of Detroit in such ways that these places become processes and social resources rather than commodities. And then still, even while the land is fallow, the urban land as farm exists as potential in that in its non-use state, it holds latent energy for later emergence. So if one considers the urban landscape as potential for farming rather than lack of building, then there really is no urban vacancy 
There's only space and waiting that's anticipating the application of productive energy. So in this view, vacant space allows an economic issue, which in this case is the lack of affordable healthy food, to be addressed with land issues, which is the proliferation of vacant land. And thus, it frees the land from these traditional economic valuations, um, such that the products of the land and the land itself become this vital community resource. So this emphasis on the productive use of land for community empowerment is key to understanding the very specific nature of urban agriculture in Detroit. For example, in 2009, the commercial farming group Hans Farms announced plans to develop the world's largest urban farm in Detroit. This farm was to be 70 acres, um, or placed on 70 acres of vacant land on the east side of Detroit, with plans to expand the farm to 20,000 acres, which is 26 squares, square miles, approximately. So for a point of comparison, the total land mass of, in Boston is 48 square miles. So this proposed farm would equal half of the total land mass of Boston, situated entirely within the city of Detroit, but still plenty of room to spare for everything else that's happening in Detroit. So that also gives you a sense of the scale of Detroit, um, the, the geographic immensity of the city um, compared to other cities. So Hans Farms anticipated um, being able to build this very large commercial farm and um, exporting products to the greater region, reaching much larger markets than the conventional, relatively smaller scaled urban agricultural farms could and also providing hundreds of agricultural jobs to local residents, at the same time removing all this vacant land from the burden of city infrastructure. On the other hand, though, while this farm would grow some fruits and vegetables, it would actually focus primarily on non-food crops, um, such as Christmas trees and corn for high fructose corn syrup. Um, so one local farmer who was um, in opposition to the Hans Farms, as many local farmers were, um, commented, quote, indeed the proposal is for the creation of a plantation amidst several hundred thousand poor and challenged residents. The jobs created would be farm labor jobs, transforming Detroit's neighborhoods into far farm labor housing if Detroit residents even got any of the work at all. So much for the Jeffersonian ideal of the, gr of a, of the agrarian freeholder as the basis of democracy. So with all this increased resistance to its plans, Hans ended up um, reducing its propose, proposal down to a five-acre fruit orchard, which actually still hasn't been built yet. But this resistance to Hans's proposal and concerns about the introduction of a literal plantation in the midst of an industrial city points to a key attribute of urban agriculture in Detroit. Land tenure is a critical issue. So thus, the phenomenon of urban agriculture in Detroit specifically is not simply about transforming vacant lots into farming plots, but about the ways in which new modes of highly localized forms of government and understanding of who land belongs to and who can use it emerges from this radically different image of the city. Of course, Detroit is not the only city that has expanded community gardens to the scale of urban farms, especially in order to support inner city neighborhoods. But it is the only American city to be on the verge of an agricultural urbanism. That is, to present urban farms at both a scale and integration into social life that, makes them, that could make them a major form of land use in the city and thus a significant influence on urban spatial practices. As a city government, its architects, planners, and businesses have struggled to revive the convention, conventional urbanism of Detroit's history, its industrial urbanism, as I mentioned earlier. In the meantime, agricultural urbanism has taken root and begun to flourish, and is in the meantime, again, changing existing meanings of what it means to be in a city. What does it mean to be urban? So again, what distinguishes agricultural or agrarian urbanism from a simple proliferation of community gardens is not just the changing land use or even the economic potential of farming, but the ways in which large-scale urban agriculture engenders these new forms of informal urban governance. So I want to touch on three um, manifestations of this informal urban governance that I see occurring in Detroit in tandem with um, large-scale urban agriculture. The first is the emergence of ecological jurisdictions. The economic activity surrounding urban agriculture, um, the selling of produce at both informal and formal markets, 
the procurement of seeds and bulbs, training for labor, exchanging labor for food, all of these things. They all provide critical links between the informal networks sustaining urban farms and the more formal networks of markets and money exchange. Urban farms, therefore, have a wider economic effect beyond the informal networks in which they originate and certainly beyond the geographies contiguous with the farms themselves. Accordingly, the activities surrounding urban agriculture begin to map a new way of envisioning the city. Rather than using streets and buildings as urban um, wayfinding tools, the location of farms, large gardens, markets, and water sources increasingly become a primary way of understanding the organization of urban space. These new ecological jurisdictions then begin to supersede traditional neighborhood block aggregations and their architectures. As seen in this map of the Rouge River Corridor, which um, lines the western edge of the city, um, we see here a collection of parks, gardens, and adjacent environmental landmarks that define a contiguous territory along in relation to, um, in relation to farms and local farmers. And so what's particular about this kind of map, um, the one that we see on the right, which just shows um, the farms and their adjacent um, um, environmental landmarks, is that the legibility of the urban environment then is derived from how space is practiced rather than how it is analyzed. Um, so the legibility of the urban environment is related to how the space is used and understood from the perspective of the human body, the perspective of the farmer, and the farmers, the relationship of the farmer to the urban farms that they're working. A second mode of informal urban governance has accompanied the changing notions of public and private space that have been brought on by urban agriculture. Um, first, of course, large sections of the city have been transformed into public space as these vacant lots, many of which had, um, had houses on them, businesses, sometimes factories, um, now become spaces that the public is making use of with urban farms. But unlike the reclamation of open land for public parks, these public spaces are places of production, of work, not just space, spaces of leisure and gathering, although they do function in that capacity as well, but they're primarily places of production um, for urban farming. So in this regard, I would say that these spaces then suggest a new 21st century conception, conception of public works. Um, on the one hand, the productive use of land becomes the literal public infrastructure um, supporting the economic, ecological, and social activity of the region. And then on the other hand, uh, maybe more figuratively, the farm itself is a place where the public literally works works collectively, works publicly. Um, work is displayed towards the entire community by way of the urban farm. Both of these modes of informal governance, the ecological jurisdiction, this new conception of a public works, they both rely on a third mode of informal governance. And that, is, and that are tacit agreements among citizens that actually subvert expert planning practices and instead are supported by knowledges obtained and sustained through local community networks. Um, these tacit agreements are ways in which knowledges concerning agricultural technologies are tr transmitted from farmer to farmer, from citizen to citizen, from farm to farm. Um, they include technical practices ranging from where and what to farm and how to handle soil drainage. Um, they also include economic and environmental concerns, such as how to evenly distribute produce across the region's markets, how to address race-based inequalities in the food distribution system, and how to develop best practices for extracting impurities from the soil. Um, these tacit agreements also govern the establishment and maintenance of social networks among farmers and residents critical resources that allow them to live even in the face of failing economic megastructures and an unstable political environment, which is the situation in Detroit today and has been at least for the last 15 years or so. And furthermore, from these tacit agreements and the spatial practices that they birth, ordinary citizens then are able to contribute directly to a mutual constitutive narrative and image of the city. 
In 2009, Detroit Mayor David Bing announced the Detroit Works Project, um, a proposal that sought in part to sustain existing regions of the city, essentially by downsizing other large sections of the city, um, so that the focus would be on sustenance rather than on growth. Um, the plan, versions of which were proposed earlier, first in 1984, then again in 1990 and 1997, um, the plan calls for discontinuing city services to largely vacant sections of the city and then providing incentives to move residents over to the more populated areas. While today there is still no stipulation for agricultural land use in the city, Mayor Bing has actually instructed city planners as part of the Detroit Works Project to integrate land use guidelines for urban farming into the new city planning code. These efforts of the city government to somewhat reluctantly um, catch up with the grassroots planning of urban farmers actually reflects the way in which the very um, public and informal knowings and knowledges of residents have begun to not just influence but actually construct a new official narrative of the city um, and especially construct this um, or uh, contribute to this new narrative of the city um, by shaping this relationship between urban life and urban forms in the city. So this issue of governance, um, these new tacit agreements evolving between the encounters between citizens, landscape, and production, um, they emphasize, again, this mutual constitution between forms of social life and urban space. They also emphasize the ways in which ordinary residents are contributing to that as opposed to um, a large manufacturing industry shaping um, that image of the city. So in this framework, urban vacancy then is not necessarily something, in Detroit at least, that hastily needs to be filled up. Um, rather, it's a phenomenon that should be understood within the context of a rapidly changing environment, um, especially as it prompts more questions for the meaning of urban in an agricultural context. Again, this is a complete reversal from the situation 100 years ago when the question being contemplated in North America was, what is the role of agrarian life in the face of the growing industrial city? So finally, as a city known for its industry turns to agriculture, as we're seeing in Detroit, as the private spaces of commerce and consumption are made into public places of production, and as the regeneration and renewal of economic exchange is found in landscape, not in architecture, then I think it causes us to reconsider the, what I'm thinking of as the evaluative term that Detroit is. Evaluative in the sense that for decades Detroit has been synonymous with the automotive industry and more broadly synonymous with the industrial city. So how can we take this evaluative term and think of it more in relation to the agricultural urbanism that's cropping up in Detroit in, in place of the industrial city so that it becomes an agricultural urbanism that is the future for the 21st century city? Okay, thank you.